As we all know, fellas, communism is when the government does stuff. The more stuff it does, the more communister it is. I should know. My totally socialist supporter, George Soros, taught me that in the Frankfurt School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Now hand over the toothbrush, white boy. Oh, beautiful! <laughs> hey, going, lads, Batco here. Boy, howdy, it's been a while. But I promise you, your wait hasn't been in vain. Unfortunately, due to shitty organization on my part, my response to Prager U's video on Israel having the quote-unquote world's most moral army is going to be put on hold. But, not to fear. There's still plenty of gold to mine and more hot takes from conservatives and libertarians to start a bushfire. And I'll tell you what, fellas, we've come across a pot of molten gold. Now, I know I might be late to the party, but I would be amiss if I didn't see the opportunity to gaze at the absolute travesty that is Joseph Klein. What a wonderful looking man he is. Now, Mr. Klein has seen it fit to create a video about communism. And while the title sounds like a Jason Unruh essay, rather than analyze communism's nature as being revolutionary, Klein simply takes it upon himself to spout propaganda and proceed to subject us to a spectacle which pretty much amounts to a right-wing circle jerk without any tint of nuance. Now, rather than take this on myself and merely be a secretarian and dismiss socialist experiments, I thought that I'd take a step towards left unity and invite a man who has given me some mutual aid in the past. Comrades, I present to you my good friend Danov. Hello. Now, unlike me, Danov is a Marxist-Leninist. And what better way to debunk false assumptions about the USSR, communism, and introduce nuance to the conversation regarding socialism throughout history than to have him on board. While we can both agree that the USSR was far from perfect, a nuanced view of its successes and its failures are essential in our discussion and progression as socialists and understanding how to conduct future socialist movements. So, with intros out of the way... Over the past century, estimates of deaths under communism range from 85 to 100 million people. Communism is a stateless, classless, and moneyless society. To call any one of these states listed here communist is simply incorrect. What is true, though, is that almost all of them were led by communist parties, which existed as a means to guide the proletariat into communism. This, however, reflects only the Leninist model, which dominated the proportion of socialist states in the 20th century. There are many other socialist and communist tendencies that have not been realized yet, due to the different conditions of each tendency and the general lack of traction in the face of the popularity of Leninism. In terms of numerical estimates, the most frequently referenced death toll source is the Black Book of Communism, which has estimated the highest high of 94 million deaths. The analyses of almost every contributing factor to this number can be disputed, on top of the fact that one of the authors themselves admitted to exaggerating within the work. Assuming the statistic used here comes from the Black Book of Communism, it, therefore, is not a reliable reference for the amount of deaths that can be accurately attributed to the governments of social states. An even bigger problem with the 85 to 100 million death range asserted here is that there are no sources or evidence to support the claim at all. But I'm not done yet! Marxism is an analysis of capitalism, among many other things. Marx himself continues to be correct about close to everything he published regarding the capitalist system. Communism was a major component of his theories, which revolutionaries sought to put into fruition throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, and still do today. To pin the blame of the extinctions of socialist states on Marx and his ideas is like blaming the failure of the Crusades on Jesus. To help illustrate my point, almost every single successful communist revolution happened in what was the feudal and semi-feudal underdeveloped world. Whereas Marx outlined the revolution must occur under the proletariat, the workers working within the modern capitalist system, not the peasantry. Revolutionaries like Lenin and Mao acted inclusively with the peasantry, which, despite working out better for the Soviets due to the Russian Empire having been less feudal with less peasantry, pre-communist China simply did not have the level of industry needed to facilitate socialism, which contributed to its later turn to capitalistic reform. This conclusion regarding China's liberalization, though, is debatable. The Soviet Union, however, did not make it to the 21st century due to various factors not directly linked with the core philosophy of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, whose Marxist-Leninist ideology was and is an expansion of Marx's ideas through Lenin's own Marxist analysis of capitalism and his development of revolutionary socialism for the conditions of his time. Marx remained ambiguous in how exactly a socialist state would be structured and how it would precisely function. To many, the collapse of the Soviet Union and increasing economic freedom in China show the failure of Marxism. Yet many remain convinced that peaceful and productive communism is possible, 
The first thing we see here is the classic ad hominem fallacy, where a supporter of communism is visually depicted as a comfortable, youthful person, presumably in the first world, lazing in an armchair. In other words, this looks like the type of guy who doesn't understand the real world, or hasn't experienced what life is in a socialist state. So because of that, it can only be presumed that his arguments and points are invalid. Still, it's definitely not like there are communist movements alive throughout the world, in nations rich and mostly poor, where people are sacrificing their lives for an egalitarian society. On top of that, a peaceful and productive communism is possible. I could just as easily say anything is possible, but there's more to it than that. Capitalism is destined to fail, with modern predictions saying it's sometime around the year 2060. Why? The falling rate of profit, a primarily Marxist concept, continues to hold true to this day. Capitalism, an economic system centered around the accumulation of profit, cannot be maintained if profits cannot be accumulated. It's not only Marx who has observed this inevitability, but the OECD as well. Operating with the constraint that human civilization is not at risk of complete destruction or decay during this process, then the only possible route for humanity to go down to is that of socialism. Feudalism is too far in the past to regress to, and fascism lies in the roots of capitalist mechanisms. Once the entire world turns to socialism through some kind of massive revolution, there will be no external pressures constantly attempting to undermine and destroy socialist or communist entities, leaving what would become a mostly frictionless path to communism unless another revolution is needed to oust corrupt bureaucrats. When asked about the Soviet Union, they may respond, but that's not real communism. Believing that dictatorship was the problem, Stalin was the problem, not Marxist ideas. But communist dictatorships are not an accident. Rather, they're the natural outcome of Marxism put into practice. This would be a straw man fallacy if it wasn't for the fact that the Soviet Union, literally, was not communist, as explained earlier. It, and other Marxist states deemed themselves socialist, having been led by communist parties, whose purposes were to lead society from a transitionary socialism into communism, as per the Lenin's model. The topic of Stalin is very much disputed among socialists, communists, and anarchists. Regardless of what can be said of his character and leadership, it holds true that Stalin's administration turned the Soviet Union from a backwards agrarian state into a world superpower in less than two decades, and was able to reach a near flawless literacy rate, guaranteed healthcare, and unparalleled economic stability for workers in the process. This was not remotely problematic. Historically, socialist revolutions have undertaken different radical left tendencies. They have not all been strictly Marxist-Leninist. If Marxist-Leninist states were the natural outcome of Marxist ideas put into practice, then libertarian communist entities such as Republican Spain, the Paris Commune, and the free territory of Ukraine would have never been able to come into fruition. You, the friendly communist, might think you're nonviolent and wouldn't create an authoritarian regime if it were you in power. In almost all cases, communists advocate for revolution, which is inherently violent. What matters though is to whom the violence is directed. To shoot a random young girl at a playground is different than to shoot a capitalist who, despite being worth billions of dollars, allows his or her workers to suffer with barely livable wages, therefore causing the strife of parents who can barely support their own young girls. Authoritarianism and violent action, depending on who you ask, is necessary to preserve the sovereignty of socialist states. They, historically, have been constantly targeted with crippling sanctions, right-wing coups, and even foreign invasions directly or indirectly by hegemonic capitalist nations. As historian and political scientist Michael Parenti put it, In May of 1921, Lenin got up before the Bolshevik Party convention and he said, We've had enough with the workers' opposition. Let's get rid of them. Now, the workers' opposition were loyal Bolsheviks. They were communists. They were in the Bolshevik Party. They were in the Communist Party. When the Kronstadt Rebellion came, the workers' opposition did not side with the Kronstadt sailors. They sided with the party. In the Civil War, they were with the party. Throughout all the struggles, the workers' opposition were with the party. But they had formed a self-conscious caucus that had decided that it would represent the particular interests of the industrial proletariat against the party itself at times. And after all this invasion, all this destruction, all this terrible death and, and, and struggle, when Lenin once said Soviet Russia is like a man with a death fever just hanging on by an inch of his life, after all that, Lenin turned and said, we've had enough opposition. The feeling very much was that that opposition was a wedge, an opening. It invited our enemies, our mortal enemies, to come in and attack us and divide us. And the party convention uproariously supported him and said, no more workers' opposition, no more factions within the party.
So right there, that emphasis on a monolithic party. And by the way, that same month or the month before in, in April, Lenin called for a strengthening of the trade unions and for more worker representation on the Central Committee of the Communist Party. So it wasn't that he was moving anti-worker, it was that he was moving against opposition. So right there you see the seeds, you see, of a, of a system that could not develop naturally with an opposition, with checks, with internal debate and argument. A system that began to strain for uniformity, for siege, for lockstep uh, cooperation, the emphasis being on organizing, uh, <clears throat> getting the thing done, stop asking too many questions because everything was a life and death issue. When the Sandinistas came to power in Nicaragua 10 years ago, filled with ideals and hopes for their nation and their people, they discovered a very awful thing. And it wasn't about themselves, even though they had to do it to themselves. It was about that capitalist encirclement. They discovered that they needed a secret police. They discovered that they needed a security police. Because all around them, coming in from two borders and within their own society, were acts of sabotage, espionage, attack, mercenary invasion, and the like. And they understood that if the revolution was going to survive, it would have to build up instruments of state power, instruments of coercion even. And these instruments, by the way, can make mistakes. And these instruments can not only make mistakes, they can commit some serious crimes. Although in Nicaragua, the impressive record is how few crimes there were, given the utterly dire conditions they were under. Those socialist or communist societies suffered terrible distorting effects. If there had been no invasion, if there had been no espionage, if there had been no attack, if there had been no white guard armies burning villages, there wouldn't have been a Red Army of that size. There wouldn't have been a Stalin, there wouldn't have been a KGB. If there hadn't been a CIA, there wouldn't have been a KGB. If there hadn't have been, if there hadn't been a, 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 a NATO encirclement, there wouldn't have been a Warsaw Pact. And to lose sight of that fact is to lose sight of an essential force of what was going on over those 70 years. The statement is also a straw man, though it is true that some fantasize about being successful revolutionaries in the same way that many fantasize about being successful wealthy capitalists. Ambition is a quality shared by all human beings, no matter what profession it involves. Furthermore, it omits the content of material conditions. Communism cannot be put into practice simply by the will of one person, no matter how much power they have in any one role. It is a historical, dialectical, and material process. A simple change in policy does not instantly produce communism or even socialism, especially for less developed nations in the modern day. Adding on to that, any full communist society would be unable to coexist with any capitalist ones, the same ones that have sought to destroy any existing system that isn't theirs or isn't puppeteered by their hands. Joseph Klein also seeks to utilize another straw man by implying that communism will be strictly reached through Marxist-Leninist revolution. As mentioned before, a socialist or communist can follow many tendencies, and the envisionment of society by each tendency can be based upon decentralized communes, syndicates, councils, and or unions based off direct democracy, as opposed to the will of the people being focused by a vanguard party. This can be seen in the same several exceptions mentioned earlier. But if you're truly dedicated to bringing about communism no matter what, you would. Don't believe me? Let's imagine your communist revolution. Be it violent or democratic, congrats. Welcome to power. It's time to organize your new classless society. This is a gross fictionalization of how power was distributed to the leaders of most socialist states. Nowhere mentioned here are, for example, the vast legislative bodies in the USSR that often check and balance those of its leaders. This was how Khrushchev was ousted the General Secretary in 1953, for expanding his position to the point of having almost limitless power. A revolution implies violence. A quote-unquote democratic revolution is contradictory to the term unless it is meant that the majority supports the revolution. For example, while revolutionaries like Bela Kun formed coalitions with the Social Democrats and was ushered in to the Hungarian government, Kun still utilized militias and force to ensure the rights of the Hungarian people and the rights of its workers were preserved. The notion of a quote-unquote democratic revolution would not make sense because the majority is needed for a revolution to succeed in the first place. And this majority will engage violently against the forces supporting the bourgeoisie, whose power comes partly from the state apparatus. A so-called revolution not actively supported 
by the majority of the population almost always is categorized as a coup, especially when a foreign entity is involved in supporting those doing the coup through equipment, direct support, as well as other means. In comparison to this, the anarchists in Catalonia did see a need to institute force against political opponents, most of which were fascists, in order to maintain the revolution. While it was true that there was more direct democracy, the revolution wasn't strictly made through democratic means via voting through a liberal democracy in which reformations and changes to the capitalist system were made through a state apparatus. Once again, a class of society cannot simply be organized for the same reasons described earlier. The first thing you might find is not everyone is so happy you're there. Society didn't unanimously settle on your vision. So many people aren't going to give up their property to be socialized willingly. But you don't believe in their right to private property anyway, so no matter. Off to the gulag with them. What was theirs is now the people's. Those people unhappy with the change to socialism would most likely be the minority of supporters of the bourgeoisie still left in society. Ultimately, there will always be a minority of people that will not support whatever system they live under. This is a reality. The bourgeoisie, particularly the modern day bourgeoisie, consists of roughly 50,000 people. To put these 50,000 people in prison to rot for the unparalleled suffering they contribute to and simply let play out is more than a fair prospect. Their property would, of course, be socialized. They own almost all of the means by which anything is produced in society. Excess living space would be designated to those who need it, as well. What Mr. Klein also seems to draw upon is the classic conflation between personal property and private property. For those who aren't familiar, in the context of capitalism, Personal property encompasses the personal belongings of an individual, such as a car, a phone, toiletries, or clothing. Private property, on the other hand, is that which is utilized to generate profit, such as a factory, an office, or a restaurant. In this case, then of course, private property would be abolished and collectivized, but personal property would remain in the hands of the individual. So, don't worry, we're not actually going to take away your toothbrushes. That wealth might sustain the proletariat for a while, but eventually you're going to have to start producing new goods for the people. From each according to their ability, to each according to their need. But if people don't get to keep what they make, they don't have an incentive motivating them. It seems as if Mr. Klein implies that Cuban socialist guerrillas were somehow motivated by a profit incentive to fight off invading imperialist armies in order to protect themselves, or that early 19th to 20th century peasantry were influenced by a profit incentive to distribute food in approaching winters or drought, which may have wreaked havoc on crops. I suppose if people were drowning on a boat and needed assistance, it would only be due to profit incentives that a person would go in and save them. It may surprise Mr. Klein, but humans aren't necessarily greedy bastards who seek to dominate each other constantly. They often need the help of other people in order to survive within a society. Unless you're looking for a profit incentive to not feed your children... That just makes no fucking sense. I mean, it's just bullshit. Fuck. Oh. To challenge Klein's claim that humans are inherently greedy and constantly predisposed to claim and conquer the land around them, Peter Kropotkin, a scientist and an anarchist who studied a millennia of evolution for his publication Mutual Aid, A Factor in Evolution, observed how European villages from Switzerland to Siberia, France and Germany were able to distribute resources based on need as opposed to profit doing so with food to aid workers and peasants, helping them survive and thrive within their own communes, as well as form syndicates to help distribute them. Kropotkin observed this through the scientific method and came to the realization that it was the state which made impositions onto the villages through private property that caused the disruption of this balance and the fall of many a commune. Now, before Mr. Klein pulls a, but that's just natural selection, Kropotkin concluded that natural selection was the driving force that shaped life, but that Darwin's ideas had been perverted and misrepresented by British scientists. Natural selection, Kropotkin argued, led to mutual aid, not competition amongst individuals. Natural selection favoured societies in which mutual aid thrived, and individuals in these societies had an innate predisposition to mutual aid because natural selection had favoured such actions. Kropotkin even coined a new scientific term, progressive evolution, to describe how mutual aid became the sine qua non of all societal life, animal and human. 
This can be observed in the ecological interactions of symbiosis and, of course, mutualism. During his time spent in the Siberian tundra, Kropotkin's research turned to the political implications of mutual aid. In the peasant villages, food and resources that were used to keep warm in the harsh winter environment was distributed according to need. But a centralized government structure was nowhere to be seen. This theory has carried on to and influenced contemporary scientists such as Lee Alan Dugatkin. On top of this observation, it would also play into the fact that capitalism is inherently violent, placing the needs of profit over human life and using whatever muscle it can to muster to attack those who might not adhere to the profit motive, disrupting natural organizations in the process. But if people don't get to keep what they make, they don't have an incentive motivating them. Then how did capitalism work so well for the past 200 years? Workers were, and are, constantly alienated from their work, never able to see its effects or their rightful compensation for it. The clear incentive there was, and is, to either work, or be fired, and starve. The incentive in a social society is to contribute to it, and to the betterment of humanity, for the reasons rooted in Kropotkin's work. In the past, monarchists did not think that society would be able to survive without the heavy guidance of the church and its ideals in everyday life. And look where we are now. Furthermore, the continued automation of work is making long working hours a thing of the past. But, the only way in which this stands as a scary prospect is in the only economic system that will happily discard its basic workers for greater profits through automation, the capitalist system. One cannot simply find another similar job if all the low-level positions are being replaced by computers, robotics, and other forms of automation. On top of that, how would these people be able to acquire credentials for better jobs if they do not have the money to formally educate themselves in order to earn said credentials. When it gets to a point where people are unable to sustain themselves or their families, violence, looting, and rioting have, and will become the last resort when no other peaceful means are left to exhaust, and government subsidies can only go so far. Not to worry, the new socialist man will take care of that. Without capitalism driving him to be greedy, his mind will be refocused to take care of all the people. Except that didn't happen in any attempt at communism ever, because man's greed might be heightened by society, but millennia of evolution have also driven a desire to collect goods for oneself. Once again, communism has never been established in any Marxist-Leninist socialist state or otherwise, and once again, the human nature argument is flawed. In addition to what has been referenced from Kropotkin's work to disprove this claim, hunter-gatherer groups existing before the agricultural revolution acted in a collective manner, with no class structures before the advent of civilization. 10,000 years is not nearly enough time to modify human genetics to the point where servility and greed is a component of a person's very being. In the same way that the class of slaves in slave society did not genetically develop to become servile, humans within capitalist society have not genetically developed to become naturally greedy especially when considering the mode of production in slave society lasted far longer than the capitalist mode of production has, and inevitably will. So how do you motivate people to keep working and provide for society? Those that don't meet their quotas, off to the gulag. And those gulags better be pretty bad too if you want people to be incentivized not to end up there. This is a clear misrepresentation of the history of the Soviet Union. What is said here is a literal farce. On top of that, as mentioned before, people aren't always motivated by fear of punishment from the evil Marxist-Leninist gulags, but motivated by society's needs in order to keep it functioning. For example, during the Spanish Civil War, production in agriculture and distribution increased within Aragon, one of the anarchist territories in Spain during this time, and distributed according to need, considering fascists were invading the territory. Now Mr. Klein might reply, but those mean old anarchists forcefully collectivized those farms and violently attacked dissidents. However, as quoted by Jose Pirats, the anarchists made a constant effort to separate active political enemies from those who are simply bourgeois by birth or ideology or economic function. Anarchist political committees wanted to know what the accused monarchists or conservatives had done, not simply what they thought or how they voted. There is no inherent contradiction involved in recognizing both that the revolution included some violence and that its social and economic results were approved of by the majority of peasants in an area. On top of that, Anarchist and CNT activist Gaston Laval comments that in those areas which defeated the fascist uprising on the 19th of July 1936, a profound social revolution took place based mostly on anarchists' ideas. 
Even more, the various agrarian and industrial collectives immediately instituted economic equality in accordance with the essential principle of communism, from each according to his ability and to each according to his needs. They coordinated their efforts through free association in whole regions, created new wealth, increased production, especially in agriculture, built more schools, and bettered public services. They instituted not bourgeois formal democracy, but genuine grassroots functional libertarian democracy, where each individual participated directly in the revolutionary reorganization of social life. They replaced the war between men, survival of the fittest, by the universal practice of mutual aid, and replaced rivalry by the principle of solidarity. <laughs> but, you know, but hey, fuck those people choosing to fight capital. Oh, I mean, fascism. Because, you know, maybe they should have debated them in the free marketplace of ideas and made them see the error of their ways. It should also be noted that if the Soviet Union was so bad, then, even after Gorbachev's Glasnost and Perestroika, the Soviet people would not have voted in favor of preserving the USSR. In reality, the opposite was the case. Over three-fourths of Soviet citizens participating in the 1991 referendum voted in favor of preserving the country, despite the fact that Gorbachev went ahead with its dissolution anyway. And if you don't get your gulag sending decisions just right, you might end up crippling your production instead, starving millions. The few famines that occurred within socialist states happened for the same primary reason that almost all other famines in history have happened. Bad weather. For the Soviet Union, the Holodomor, a part of the Greater Soviet Famine of 1932 to 1933, was caused by poor seed quality, poor cultivation of the crop, crop infestations, and dry weather, which led to an overestimation of the total crop yield for that harvest season. Three of these four factors were on the part of the Kulaks, wealthy peasant farmers who would later sabotage large portions of their yields in order to resist collectivization by the Soviet government. While it can be argued that the management of grain distribution and farms was poor on the Soviet government's part, which no doubt indirectly played into the resulting death toll, it was still able to effectively remedy the damage before the next harvest season, preventing any further calamities. In any case, the root causes of the famine were not rooted in Soviet policy, although policy did shape the remainder of the famine once most of the damage had already been done. As for China, its Great Leap Forward was a sensitive transitionary process that was devastated by, unsurprisingly, forward weather conditions. The fact that it was going through major economic changes at the time was inconsequential to the notion that a bad harvest was set to come. But the Great Leap Forward being there in the wrong place at the wrong time undoubtedly worsened the difficult situation. Both countries, after each having only one significant famine under socialism, accomplished complete food security for the rest of their existences. This perspective is too often overlooked. And if indeed conditions start to deteriorate, you can't let the people know it's better elsewhere or else they'll want to leave, worsening your production difficulties. The same claim can be made for any government, socialist or not. The United States is a titan of propaganda, so much so that most people do not remotely realize their own manipulation but then go on to criticize people in other countries for being manipulated themselves. Sounds pretty ironic, don't you think? In the case of the Soviet Union, their citizens' referendum to maintain the Union in 1991 was near 80% in favor. Yet, despite this, Gorbachev went against the interests of the people and dissolved it anyway. It was clear that the Soviet people were right. The GDP of post-Soviet republics plummeted, leading to the poverty and poor conditions that so many in the West seemed to assign to the Soviet Union and communism not Yeltsin's shock therapy capitalism, in the modern day. As a side note, the North Korean famines and economic devastation during the 1990s were directly caused by Yeltsin's complete cutting of aid to the country, not the North Korean system failing on its own. Furthermore, even though I as an anarchist disagree with the Soviet model East Germany was built upon, if it was so horrible as conservatives such as Klein say, then why is it that in a survey conducted in 2009 by Spiegel, roughly 57% of East Germans defended its existence? Wow! It's almost as if Mr. Klein is directly espousing baseless and out-of-context propaganda and assuming, once again, that communism in and it of itself is an entirely totalitarian, vanguard, Marxist, evil, gulag, uh, fucking model as opposed to the goal that all communists want to achieve, a classless, stateless, moneyless society. You don't have to have a violent evil goal to end up with evil if the demands of reality necessitate violence and evil to bring about your goal. 
Stop comparing the supposed evils of capitalism and reality to communism in your fantasy and start comparing the realities of both. Let's just assume for a moment that Mr. Klein is right in how he regards all forms of communism to be a totalitarian nightmare which impedes on individuality and human rights. However, this is nothing compared to the authoritarian nature of capitalism, both past and present. Wars and campaigns for claiming land and resources are still waged today by imperialist powers, often degrading the inhabitants of said country. An example of the authoritarian nature of capitalism can be found within the coup staged by the US government under advisement of the Chicago boys within Chile. During this coup, they overthrew the first democratically elected Marxist leader in South America, Salvador Allende, and replaced him with a dictator and US puppet, Augusto Pinochet, who abolished trade unions and mass privatized institutions. Through the state, he was able to commit vast human rights atrocities, such as using rape as a method of torture, while Chile's economy plummeted and unemployment skyrocketed. It was only after Pinochet's rule and members of his right-wing dictatorship were dismissed that it was able to recover economically. What I also be amiss in the economic policies conducted by Mussolini, who implemented a corporatist form of capitalism, which also sought to crush workers' unions, maintain class relationships, keep women within their homes as mere reproducers of the nation, and was able to conduct authoritarian purges of political dissidents. But let me guess, that's just third positionism, and or another form of left-wing politics. Should I also be amiss that China is robbing Africa of its oil resources and crushing workers' rights as they conduct imperialism within African countries such as Uganda? And would I also be amiss of trade embargoes placed on Cuba and Yemen, the latter of which, no thanks to the embargoes, is undergoing a mass famine? On top of that, it's thanks to capitalism that we are undergoing a refugee crisis that is forcing people to leave their homes under account of US-backed terrorist groups that are destabilizing nations across the Middle East, often for seeking out natural resources that they can use to continue this same cycle. Whatever the comparison between the Soviet Union under Stalin is, capitalism has been responsible for more misery, suffering, and destruction than any Marxist-Leninist government. One has lifted billions of people out of poverty, the other has killed 100 million of them. The notion that capitalism has lifted billions out of poverty comes from the individual wealth of those in the third world, which is gauged by the passing of an arbitrary monetary margin set up by the World Bank. An organization that has, in doing so, hastily generalized the definition of poverty for each sovereign state. The most often used benchmark for extreme poverty is the incremented $1 line, which has not risen with inflation or been updated to meet new economic conditions and developments for the past decade. While it is true that the poverty line has changed since its inception, it has not been updated since 2008, and the means by which extreme poverty is defined, a dollar amount, means that hundreds of millions of people can be lifted out of poverty simply by changing its definition altogether, as it was a decade ago. Furthermore, the poverty line set by the World Bank has not reflected that of every nation accurately. In 1990, a survey in Sri Lanka found that over a third of the population fell below the national poverty line. Yet, in the same year, the World Bank reported only 4% of the Sri Lankan population lived under poverty, according to their international poverty line standard. This goes to show that the claimed decrease in poverty has actually been falsified through an inaccurate use of the purchasing power of a currency to determine the real conditions and needs of different human populations across the world. The other has killed 100 million of them. I thought it was a range of 85 to 100 million people. Estimates of deaths under communism range from 85 to 100 million people. Adding on to that, there is still no source for this statistic in the video or the description. People get thrown out of universities for not properly referencing information, and yet here, there are no references at all. This is a telling sign of academic dishonesty, if anything. I'm Joseph Klein, thanks for watching. Now, fellas, in any other given circumstance, we might take it upon ourselves to end the video here. But wait! There's more! Hang on to your seat, baby, cause this one's a screamer! Mr. Klein will probably link us a response to his article made in retaliation to his communist critics. So, being the masochists we are, we took it upon ourselves to respond to his article as well. We thus take it upon ourselves to advise our viewers that these takes are nuclear, and we recommend protective gear upon further viewing. So, with that out of the way, is it true that Joseph Klein's communist critics are wrong? Let's find out. A number of commenters allege that capitalism is responsible for more deaths than communism. Others declared a moral equivalence that, while communism is violent, so is capitalism.
It is true that people are violent and we don't live in utopia, and there will be violence under any system. But there is a difference between violence and death that happens under an economic system and violence and death that is caused by that system. Many commenters use colonialism, the United States alleged war for oil in Iraq, or other wars for resources as examples. Put aside the fact that the United States imported more oil from Iraq in the years immediately before the Iraq war than it has since, and consider. Even if a capitalist nation were to go to war strictly to obtain resources, capitalism would not necessarily be the cause of that war. Well, let's start with colonialism and focus on countries within Africa. As of January 2014, 14 African countries are obliged by France through a colonial pact to put 85% of their foreign reserve into France in a central bank under the French Minister of Finance control. They are effectively putting in 500 billion dollars every year to the French Treasury. African leaders who refuse are killed or victim of coup. For example, leaders such as Thomas Sankara. As covered in an article by Global Research, Sylvanus Olympio, the first president of the Republic of Togo, who, instead of signing the Colonization Continuation Pact with de Gaulle, instead agreed to pay an annual debt to France for the so-called benefits of French colonization. This prevented the French not destroying the country before they left. However, the amount estimated by France was so big that the reimbursement of the so-called colonial debt was close to 40% of the country budget in 1963. Olympio's dream was to build an independent and self-sufficient and self-reliant country, but the French had him killed by a sergeant who was given a $612 bounty by the French embassy. There are a number of components of the colonization pact that have been in effect since the 1950s. The main points being that the African countries should deposit their natural monetary reserves in the France Central Bank. France has been holding the national reserves of 14 African countries since 1961. Benin, Burkina Faso, Guinea-Bissau, Ivory Coast, Mali, Niger, Senegal, Togo, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Chad, Congo Brazzaville, the Equatorial Guinea and Gabon. Despite the two main African banks having African names, they have no monetary policies of their own. In fact, France allows them to access only 15% of the money in any given year. If there is need for any money, they need to borrow the extra money from their own 65% from the French treasury at commercial rates. Also, they were obliged to send France an annual balance and reserve report. If they refuse to send it, they would not be entitled to any money. History has shown that despite years of African fighting to liberate themselves, France repeatedly used many ex-foreign legionaries to carry out coups against elected presidents. This included jean Badel Bacasa, who assassinated David Daco, the first president of the Central African Republic. In the last 50 years, a total of 67 coups has occurred in 26 African countries, of which 16 are ex-French colonies. This indicates that France is desperate to hold on to whatever land it has in Africa, as well as the fact that capitalism is utilized to conduct war for the sake of obtaining resources, as well as the fact that people have suffered as a result of the capitalist system, contrary to what Mr. Klein believes. Now, in regards to the section of his talk of the US's involvement in the Middle East, it's a bit interesting that Klein mentions that the United States imported more oil from Iraq in the years immediately before the Iraq war. I mean, it's almost as if the US was utilizing Saddam Hussein as a puppet for US imperialism to conduct a war against the Soviets. Hmm. According to current and former US officials who spoke on condition of anonymity, Iraq was then regarded as a key buffer and strategic asset in the Cold War with the Soviet Union. For example, in the mid-1950s, Iraq was quick to join the anti-Soviet Baghdad Pact, which was to defend the region and whose members included Turkey, Britain, Iran, and Pakistan. On top of that, the US lifted sanctions on Iraq in order for them to continue trade in order to conduct their war against Iran and allied with Saddam Hussein to continue their war effort. It is only until the relation between the two countries soured that obviously Iraq's oil exports to the US would have likely declined. I mean, 
invasion from other imperialist powers tends to do this. But even then, after the war, Iraq has become the second largest exporter of oil to the US. I mean, I don't mean to sound like an anarchist Alex Jones, but it's almost as if the US played a giant role in robbing a country of its resources through force in order to keep itself financed. I mean, it's, it's one hell of a coincidence that after years of war against Iraq, it's a bit odd that the country has now become a giant exporter of oil to the country that it was invaded by. My communist critics seem to be operating under the notion that capitalism is nothing but the pursuit of private profits by any means necessary. Rather, amongst other characteristics, capitalism is a system of private ownership and voluntary exchange. Going to war in order to steal other people's stuff is a violation of capitalist principles, not a fulfillment of those principles. Theft of resources, or, more broadly, the initiation of force, is directly contrary to capitalist beliefs. To those who might accuse me of a double standard for discussing my fantasy of capitalism rather than real capitalism, only need to look to Switzerland, a nation ranked substantially more capitalist than the United States and that has not been in a foreign war since 1815, to see that peace is compatible with capitalism. What I find hilarious about this is that when people tell you that it wasn't true communism, you make a similar argument to, well, that's not true capitalism. The difference being is that communism, as we stated before, is the establishment of a stateless, classless, moneyless society. What makes the communist right and you wrong is the analysis of capital and its ownership by the bourgeoisie. The fact that the Saudi government has mass private ownership of its oil reserves and voluntarily exchanges oil with the US for profit by your logic would fall within your view as to what you deem to be capitalist. But you would probably neglect the fact that the Saudis use their funds of said profit to fund jihadist groups in order to increase its sphere of influence within the Middle East and turn around and say, oh, well, that wasn't true capitalism. As for Switzerland being the peace-loving country that you deem it to be, you do realize that they are the second biggest arms exporter in the world. And while it is true that Switzerland has long maintained neutral positions in international conflicts, they appear to have no qualms sending their military equipment to regimes accused of human rights abuses. In 2013, their customers included Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Pakistan and China. Siam and Wesemann, an arms export at SIPRI, told AFP, in the past, they wouldn't have done business with Saudi Arabia due to human rights concerns. It's obviously a place that rings all kinds of alarm bells, but that has changed. They've sold them radar tracking systems and anti-tank missiles and marketed other weapons there. I mean, gee golly willikers, Mr. Klein, it seems as if capitalism cares more about profits than human lives. Hmm. Really makes you think. A related argument downplays the violence associated with communism. Some critics of my video claim that we inflated the number of communism caused deaths. In fact, the number of deaths we used in the video, 85 to 100 million, is based on a number of estimates that are credible and are not seriously challenged. The work that's considered the best source for these statistics is the one we sourced the numbers at the start of the video from, the Black Book of Communism published by Harvard University Press. The numbers are of deaths directly caused by communism, not simply of deaths that happened in communist countries, as some commenters alleged. That book has its critics and the numbers may not be perfectly accurate. I'm open to debating if it's a few million less, but non-historians claiming only a tiny fraction of that amount died in the numbers of propaganda are conspiracy theorists tantamount to holocaust deniers. I guess all Marxist-Leninists are Nazgul's now. As touched on earlier, the Black Book of Communism is not a reliable source, but nonetheless, this statement warns a deeper search into its inaccuracies. In 2001, the Maoist internationalist movement informed Harvard University Press of undeniable errors in the Black Book of Communism. MIM even got Harvard University Press's Mark Kramer to admit that the book contained remedial math errors. In regards to repression under Stalin, citing the work of A. Blum, Worth no longer believed Stalin masterminded the Kirov assassination in 1934. It was the killing of Kirov that resulted in a swing in Soviet public opinion toward a crackdown on dissent as World War II was progressing, notably the Japanese invasion of China in 1931 and the Italian invasion of Ethiopia in 1935. Two, 
Worth correctly believes Robert Conquest's work on the Great Terror to be exaggerated. MIM would say fictional. 3. According to Worth, the 85% of executions after the Civil War in the Soviet Union, and while Stalin was still alive, occurred in the Great Terror, also sometimes referred to as the purges of 1936-1938. However, Worth said the number of executions has been vastly exaggerated. The number was 681,692. While everyone agrees that the majority of executions occurred in the 1936-1938 period, while the Soviet Union and Germany were already fighting each other in Spain, the numbers range wildly. Anton Antonov of Sayenko said that the Great Terror was responsible for 19 million deaths from 1935 to 1941, while Worth says that the figure is 720,000. This is just an indication of how wildly the bourgeoisie speculates against Stalin. 4. Purges in the Red Army prior to World War II were previously exaggerated and affected 30,000 out of 178,000 relevant cadres. 5. Documented cases occurred where all Mensheviks said to be shot were not shot, but imprisoned. The Maoist internationalist movement has more wars than the Soviet Union, though what also needs to be addressed is the Black Book of Communism's claims concerning Socialist China. To their credit, the authors admitted that their criticisms of Asian Communists and therefore most of their criticism of Communism is speculative. The reason is that they would like to see the governments there to fall so that they can see the archives before they pass judgment. The largest part of the 100 million deaths they are attributing to Communism comes from the Great Leap, where they used the upper end of a range of estimates, 43 million deaths. MIM recently reviewed this literature again in MIM Notes 203, since Howard Professor Roderick McFarker's book just came out in paperback. Contrary to McFarker, who details all the actions that the Communist Party took and how Mao made public self-criticism, Margolin says Mao refused to admit a problem during the Great Leap. He then goes on to list wartime atrocities in World War II by the Communists. Even more than McFarker, who misplaced a decimal in his largest accusation against Mao to make it ten times worse than it was, Margolin leaves us seriously questioning his basic quantitative skills. We can only hope it was the editors or translators who introduced the errors, but there were numerous basic mathematical errors in this chapter and no matter how one slices it, the chapter does not reflect well on the authors and editors. There is clearly more to what MIM had to say about the Black Book of Communism, so the link to the whole critique will be among the source list in the description, for those wanting to take a closer look at that. From these mere excerpts, it should stand clear that the book is not academically credible enough to rely on for statistics concerning the death toll of so-called communist governments. Many of my communist critics seem to believe that their utopia would have enough resources to fulfill everyone's needs and that scarcity would not be a problem. One commenter even suggested that under communism people would only need to work 4 hours a day 4 days a week. They seem to believe that capitalists hoarding wealth at the top is the only thing standing in the way of bringing this about. This notion is absurd. Capitalism does not create poverty and death. Reality creates poverty and death. Capitalism is the system that has provided us with the material wealth to lessen and delay it. Oh shit lad, somebody call the academic agent because Klein is talking about the real world. Well, how about this for a dose of reality? According to Oxfam, last year we saw the biggest increase in the number of billionaires in history, one more every two days. There are now 2,000 and 43 dollar billionaires worldwide. In 12 months, the wealth of this elite group has increased by 762 billion dollars. This is enough to end extreme poverty seven times over. In the period between 2006 and 2015, ordinary workers saw their incomes rise by an average of just 2% a year, while billionaire wealth rose by nearly 13% a year almost six times faster. 82% of all growth in global wealth in the last year went to the top 1%, while the bottom half of humanity saw no increase at all. While billionaires in one year saw their fortunes grow by $762 billion, women provide 10 trillion in unpaid care annually to support the global economy. New data from Credit Suisse means 42 people now own the same wealth as the bottom 3.7 billion people. And that last year's figure has been revised from 8 to 61 people owning the same as the bottom 50%. The richest 1% continue to own more wealth than the whole of the rest of humanity. In countries across the world, the same picture is emerging. In 2017, research by Oxfam and others has shown that, in Nigeria, the richest man earns enough interest on his wealth in one year to lift 
2 million people out of extreme poverty. Despite almost a decade of robust economic growth in Nigeria, poverty has increased over the same period. In Indonesia, the four richest men own more wealth than the bottom 100 million people. The three richest people in the US own the same wealth as the bottom half of the US population, roughly 160 million people. But there's still more. In Brazil, someone earning the minimum wage would have to work 19 years to make the same amount as a person in the richest 0.1% of the population makes in one month. Approximately a third of billionaire wealth is derived from inheritance. Over the next 20 years, 500 of the world's richest people will hand over $2.4 trillion to their heirs, a sum larger than the GDP of India, a country of 1.3 billion people. Monopolies fuel excessive returns to owners and shareholders at the expense of the rest of the economy. The power of monopoly to generate extreme wealth is demonstrated by the fortune of Carlos Slim, the sixth richest man in the world. His fortune derives from an almost complete monopoly he was able to establish over fixed line, mobile and broadband communication services in Mexico. The OECD found that this monopoly has had significant negative effects for consumers and the economy. Monopoly power is compounded by cronyism, the ability by powerful private interests to manipulate public policy to entrench existing monopolies to create new ones. Privatization deals, natural resources given away, below fair value, corrupt public procurement or tax exemptions and loopholes are all ways in which well-connected private interests can enrich themselves at the expense of the public. In total, Oxfam has calculated that approximately two-thirds of billionaire wealth is the product of inheritance, monopoly, and cronyism. Oxfam's survey of 10 countries show that over half of respondents think that despite hard work, it is difficult or impossible for ordinary people to increase the money they have. Economic rewards are increasingly concentrated at the top, while millions of ordinary workers remain on poverty wages. Returns for shareholders and senior executives have gone through the roof. In South Africa, the top 10% of society receives half of all wage income, while the bottom 50% of the workforce receives just 12% of all wages. With just slightly more than one day of work, a CEO in the US earns the same as an ordinary worker makes during the whole year. Men are consistently the majority of the best paid employees. On average, it takes just over four days for a CEO from the top five companies in the garment sector to earn what an ordinary Bangladeshi woman worker earns in her whole lifetime. The fortunes of the richest are often boosted by tax dodging, the rich individuals and by the corporations of which they are owners or shareholders. Using a global network of tax havens, as revealed in the Panama and Paradise Papers, the super rich are hiding at least 7.6% trillion dollars from the tax authorities. New analysis by economist Gabriel Zuckman for this paper has shown that this means that the top 1% is evading an estimated $200 billion in tax. Developing countries are losing at least $170 billion each year in foregone tax revenues from corporations and the super rich. This is the reality, Mr. Klein. But let me guess. That's not true capitalism. Since Homo sapiens evolved 315,000 years ago we have been poor and hungry. What needs explaining is not poverty that's the state of nature. What needs explaining is how we became so wealthy. And humanity has become massively wealthy. I shouldn't need to convince Marxists that capitalism is responsible for this given that Marx himself believed it. Though Marx of course believed and desired that capitalism would be replaced by socialism at the right point in history. He also viewed capitalism as an inevitable and necessary economic system to accumulate wealth. This is primarily true, but the only flaw here is that Marx did not simply want capitalism to be replaced by socialism. His conclusion came about through scientific analysis. It's true that humanity produces more food than we need to feed the world, a common left-wing talking point. But the problem is not that the bourgeoisie is hoarding all of it, 
even looking away from the first world, Africa produces enough food for its own population. The problem is we have issues storing food and getting it where it needs to be. Some argued more broadly that the first world bourgeoisie has exploited the third world proletariat, but this is not true. First world trade with third world nations helps relieve their poverty. Trade helps the poor overcome their state of nature. Well, if Africa is able to produce enough food, why does it suffer as a continent? I mean, it's not like capitalist systems of government implement tariffs on African businesses perpetuating a cycle of poverty, as well as funding foreign businesses to outcompete African farmers. Oh wait, it does. This is expanded upon in an article from an aptly named organization, Trade Unionists Against the EU, which covers the negative effects of the common agricultural policy which was implemented by the EU. It writes, The most obvious and damaging exhibit is of course the common agricultural policy which takes up half the EU budget and lavishes subsidies onto the EU's biggest landowners at the expense of millions of the poorest farmers in Africa. The criminal £30 billion a year subsidy regime allows the EU to dump thousands of tons of heavily subsidized food into Africa every year. As a result, local producers cannot export their products because they compete with the lower prices made possible by the CAP. For instance, EU farmers are guaranteed a price for their sugar, which is three times higher than the world price. Mozambique loses more than £100 million a year because of restrictions on importing into the EU, coupled with the dumping of cheap exports at its door, while many thousands of workers in Swaziland have lost their jobs because the local industry cannot compete. Kenya, Nigeria and Senegal have been hit by cheap, subsidised imports from Europe, while the £30 paid to British farmers for every tonne of wheat they produce inflates the price of breakfast cereals, bread and other goods in Britain. And finally, as stated in an article by worldhunger.org, which covers the benefits of European farmers of Africa that they have over indigenous farming populations, through the CAP, Europe's farmers are given various support programs and large subsidies, including producer subsidies, subsidies to processes, and exports subsidies. These enable farmers to earn a high price for their products while consumers still pay reasonable prices in the shops. African governments simply cannot afford to give their farmers the same benefits as European farmers receive through the CAP. The mental model that many socialists work under that causes them to believe that the opposite is the case is what I call the fixed pie model of economics, which is that under capitalism, for the rich to get richer the poor must get poorer that the rich can only get rich by taking what would otherwise belong to the poor. But there is not a fixed pie of wealth in society, rather there is a growing pie. In fact, while the rich have been getting richer, the poor have been getting richer too. And the rich getting richer helps the poor get richer. If one knows this, still considering income inequality a major problem appears to be nothing but jealousy. As mentioned previously by Danov, this is not the case. In reality, the poor remain stagnant, if not worse off than in the past. 50 years ago South Korea was as poor as Ghana. Under capitalism and free trade with the first world, it has become the 11th richest country in the world just under Canada. Meanwhile, communist and economically isolated North Korea, isolated in part because of sanctions and in part because of its Jush philosophy of self-reliance, ranks at 113, five spots below war-torn Afghanistan. When nationalist and lover of the West Boris Yeltsin came to power in Russia prior to the dissolution of the Soviet Union, he cut off all trade and relations with the DPRK, a significant client state of the now defunct USSR, which then suffered massive economic turmoil, food insecurity, and subsequent famines. We can see that the DPRK faced these woes not because their system was at fault, but because their primary trading partner suddenly cut off all aid, which destroyed its economy. Add in the sanctions from almost all of its neighbors, a practice too frequent across the histories of social states, and you end up with what caused the huge disparity between the North's economy and the South's economy. You do realize that the DPRK's economic growth had outgrown South Korea's in 2016, right? 
In a report on major North Korean statistics indicators for 2017, published on the 15th of December by Statistics Korea, covered that per capita gross national income was 1.46 million won, or around 122nd of the 31.98 million total for South Korea. North Korea's growth rate last year was 3.9%, putting it ahead of South Korea's 2.8%. It was the first time that North Korea's growth rate outpaced South Korea's since 2008, when its rate was 3.1% to the South's 2.8%. North Korea's high growth rate for the last year was attributed to a baseline effect after drought conditions in 2015 severely reduced food and power production, resulting in negative growth. Claiming that communism or socialism could possibly work better at alleviating poverty seems absurd from that one statistic alone. But there's also the vast number of deaths from hunger under communism. The Black Book of Communism estimates 11 million in the Soviet Union alone, in certain cases leading people as far as cannibalism. Many commenters were quick to point out that there have been famines and deaths from poverty under capitalism as well. But the degree is not even close. In 1984, life expectancy in Russia was 6 years lower than Western Europe, infant mortality was 3 times higher, and 17% of Soviets lived below the poverty line. Klein uses alleged data from the Russian SFSR in order to make a statement for all socialist states' ability to alleviate poverty and famine. However, there is more conclusive data that covers the basis for all capitalist and socialist states of the early 1980s in such a way that is organized for a comparison between the two systems. According to a publication by American doctors Shirley Soresto and Howard Waitzkin, using data compiled directly from the World Bank, it is found that Klein's statement on the matter falls completely short, in opposition to the vague information of his cited from the Chicago Tribune. For all established socialist countries, in comparison to all capitalist ones, it can be seen that the life expectancy of those living in the former stood at 69 years across all income categories, whereas the average life expectancy of the latter stood at merely 62.6 .6 years in the same regard. Note that the people in the low income bracket for capitalist countries lived an average of 48 years, whereas in the same bracket for socialist countries, the figure was a staggering 67 years, almost two decades longer. Infant mortality rates per thousand people for capitalist countries were 50% more than that of their socialist counterparts compositely, with 67.4 deaths per thousand and 43.3 deaths per thousand, respectively. For the low income bracket, capitalist countries exceeded their socialist counterparts in infant mortality rate by twice as many people per thousand. As for calorie consumption, it can be seen that the maximum daily per capita supply for socialist countries stood at a composite value of 20% in excess, whereas the same value for capitalist countries stood slightly under, at 17% in excess. For the low-income bracket, the value for socialist countries stood at 7% in excess, whereas for capitalist countries, it stood at a deficit of 6% below the minimum requirement. As for other variables, it can be seen that socialist nations outmatched their capitalist counterparts for all income categories in child death rate by a factor of over 3 times, in physicians per person by over 5 times, in nurses per person by almost 2 times, in literacy rate by over 2 times, and in physical quality of life by over 15 points. Ouch. Many claim that Western European or Scandinavian nations are socialist and have a high standard of living, but they are far from socialist. All Western economies are mixed economies that have some socialized elements and Scandinavia is no different, but Sweden is ranked the 19th most capitalist nation in the world, just two positions less economically free than the United States. This mistake is aided by the confusion between social democracy and democratic socialism, helped along by Bernie Sanders' use of the term democratic socialism to incorrectly describe Scandinavia. Social democracies have some income redistribution and welfare state policies, but are otherwise capitalist. Democratic socialism is socialism brought about and managed through democracy rather than dictatorship. Even arch-capitalist economist F. A. Hayat believed that modest social insurance programs could be compatible with capitalism, so long as they followed the rule of law and couldn't grow endlessly. Well, Klein is primarily right here. Still, it is important to note that the democracy Klein refers to is bourgeois quote-unquote democracy, and implying that just because socialism is not attempted through bourgeois democracy does not mean that it is a dictatorship, other than the dictatorship of the proletariat. There's a reason socialism can't succeed at creating economic growth in the long run, and that's because socialism is missing the basic building blocks that allow for successful economic planning. Primarily, prices derived not by fiat, but by the real information of supply and demand which can only be learned through market exchange. And that's not the only way in which Marx was wrong about economics. 
Economic embargoes aside, what's hilarious about this segment is that Mr. Klein seems to hold the USSR and the DPRK as prime examples of socialism throughout this article, and thus states that its failures of economic growth are inherent to the system. Though I would be still of the opinion that the DPRK is state capitalist, he could not have chosen a worse target. I'm sure he would be surprised of the DPRK's economic growth despite embargoes, as mentioned earlier. Even more laughable is that Mr. Klein would imply that the USSR, as an example of socialism, is a failure of economic growth, despite evidence to the contrary. Although the methods of achieving this growth are, in my opinion, highly questionable, there is no doubt they yielded results. Soviet Russia's GDP grew an annual 9.11% on average from 1945 to 1950, while the Soviet Union's GDP increased around 14.7% in the period. Such high economic growth is explained by the initial strong positive impulse after the victory in the war despite many difficulties and a famine. Free labor from millions of prisoners of war and convicts, as well as the dividends of the great victory and all its derivatives. In the Soviet Union, the growth rate was still higher due to intensive rebuilding programs in devastated territories. Furthermore, the Soviet Union had made tremendous efforts and achieved unbelievable results as it built more than 14,200 large enterprises. Production in the chemical and petrochemical industries soared more than 660% in 1945 to 1960. Oil production skyrocketed 650%, gas production by 1,250%, and coal production by 235%. Machine building and metal processing boosted output by 600%. Production of steel and cast iron grew 430% from 12.3 million tons and 8.8 .8 million tons to 65.3 million tons and 46.8 million tons respectively. The share of heavy industry in the Soviet economy was steadily growing. In 1945, it accounted for 60% compared with 40% for light industry. By 1950, it had reached 68.8% against 31.2% and by 1960, it stood at 72.5% against 27.5%. Labor productivity increased 50% from 1945 to 1950 due to mechanization and initial automation in industrial production. It increased 200% in the period from 1945 to 1960. Now, while the USSR is not the go-to example I myself would point to as the shining example of socialism, with me being an anarchist and all that, given the evidence that we see, however, it cannot be denied that the USSR throughout its years was an economic powerhouse. Mr. Klein should take effort to at least read about how the USSR was an economic powerhouse before making an absolute ass out of himself. I see now how people don't get to keep what they make could be wrongly interpreted as applying to capitalism under the Marxist notion of surplus value. That idea claims that because capitalists make profit from the work of those they employ, that profit is surplus value that rightfully belongs to the workers who supposedly created it, not the capitalist who extracted it from them. Klein makes little distinction between surplus extraction and alienation. On alienation, Marx elaborates that despite the fact that workers maintain and utilize the means of production to create products, it is ultimately the capitalist who has control of what those products are, where those products go, and how those products are distributed, not the workers who produce them. Even though the workers make the products, they still have to pay the capitalist to obtain them. It is ultimately the worker who is responsible for placing in the labor necessary to make the product, but the capitalist does none of that work and only profits off the product once it is made, and sold for much higher than what the worker is paid for. But that so-called surplus value is not surplus at all, rather it's paying for vital economic functions. Firstly, there is the role of the entrepreneur, the person who is being paid for coming up with the idea without which the workers wouldn't have anything to produce. What Mr. Kleist says here is also laughable as he assumes that anyone who may be of the working class is somehow incapable of creating original content. That quote-unquote surplus value that's going to quote-unquote vital economic functions, no thanks to the capitalist, has enough money to get the world out of poverty seven times over. If the vital economic function is to keep other people poor in order to maintain their hold over them, then capitalism exceeds in this manner. Second, Profit tells capitalists where resources are needed and incentivizes them to shift more resources into it. 
in the long run bringing prices down and reducing profit via competition. Third, profit is a potential payment in the future to capitalists for foregoing money in the present, a return on investment. Without capitalists foregoing money in the present to pay wages to their workers, workers wouldn't be able to afford to produce things that take a while to earn money. Some companies don't even see revenue let alone profit for years. Of course also, many companies fail to turn a profit and go bust, in which case the capitalist paid workers wages yet saw no profit or exploited surplus value all. Moreover, the notion that one's labor even has a specific value is wrong. The idea of surplus value is subsidiary to Marx's labor theory of value, which to his credit, was also the approach of many classical economists of the 18th and 19th century including Adam Smith and David Ricardo. It holds that the value of a product comes from the amount of labor put into it, but if there's any reason that Marxist economics is rejected by the mainstream, which it is, it's that it still holds on to this outdated premise. For well over a century, mainstream economics has subscribed to the subjective theory of value, which holds that the value of a product is determined by how much it's desired by people. To disprove the LTV, Klein needs to provide a contradiction to the theory, or show that some element of it cannot be observed in reality. Instead, he uses the ad populum fallacy. Just because many mainstream economists do not subscribe to the theory does not make it incorrect especially when considering professors such as Paul Cockshut and Richard Wolff continue to show that it remains accurate and relevant in the modern day. The LTV doesn't purport to measure value and prices universally. As such, the LTV only measures equilibrium prices for commodity goods, not the market price of the commodity itself. For a lot of the other cases mentioned, saying startups are risky, the business owners takes risks, a, a lot of that has to do with the fact that these businesses are not entirely in a steady state. Mr. Klein seems to neglect the businesses that are already steady and continue to exploit their workers with the capitalist sitting comfortably. This is obviously correct, as if the labor theory of value was true. Someone could dig a ditch in the woods for no purpose and expect their useless hole to have the same value as any other use of their time. On the subjective theory of value, one's labor only has value because there is a market of employers willing to buy it. Without that there is not only no possibility for surplus value, but no possibility for any value at all. Arguably, the hole is more likely to serve as a landfill or be used to plant a tree. By Klein's logic, public education does not have value unless it is dictated by market desires, despite educational institutions and the workers of said institutions providing a societal benefit. Value does not mean the same thing in the subjective theory of value as it does in the labor theory of value. It is a quantitative notion used to explain equilibrium prices. What determines the quantity of value of a good is the socially necessary labor time required for its reproduction. That is the basic idea of the LTV. There is a difference between the value of what the worker is paid and the quantity of value the worker produces. The worker produces more value than that of his daily wage in the course of a work day. When you subtract the value of his wage from his labor time, that is the surplus value left over to the capitalist. This surplus value is much higher than what is necessary to compensate for vital economic functions and the paycheck of the capitalist. It's a condition for a good to have value, which is why the example falls flat, because the LTV doesn't measure goods based on supply and demand. It says that the labor theory of value of a commodity is proportionate to the labor time used to produce the good. Lastly, perhaps the majority of critical comments didn't accept that the video was a critique of communism at all. I was accused of not understanding communism, not having read Marx, or criticizing state capitalism instead of real communism. To these people, I have little to say besides reiterating the point of the video to attempt to get through their cognitive dissonance. It doesn't matter if the Soviet Union or other so-called communist nations were indeed communist per Marx's definition. Clearly they were not, but if you do not believe that the goal of their evolutions was to institute socialism, which would then turn into communism, and if you do not believe that they were genuine in their desires, simply reread Lenin, Mao, and the others, and ask yourself why so many communists would rally around them if they were in Janoon. No their intent was clear. Any single failed example could be excused, but when every nation that called itself communist has failed to achieve it, it signals that's because communism cannot be achieved. Their attempts to fight against reality have only been sustained through violence until they inevitably crumble. Given how poorly you've portrayed the ideas of Marx in both your publications, it isn't difficult to understand why commenters have made such critical responses in the first place.
Marx, by scientifically analyzing history and the social relations by which we have gotten to this current point in history, concluded that capitalism, like the modes of production of yore, is meant to collapse through self-contradiction. Revolutionaries, inspired by Marx, sought to bring about socialism when the material conditions were right, and it is clear that the masses were on their side up until the very end. While no socialist state ever called itself communist in name, every socialist state has faced violence and turmoil, from outside forces seeking to undermine and destroy them over their choice of self-determination. North Korea, regardless of what you can say about it, has never conducted genocide, imperialist wars for resources, or nation-scarring coups on other countries, despite its title as the biggest threat to global peace. How ironic. What you call reality is the truth that for anything that steps out of line, force, aggression, and violence are used to bend into the knees of the hegemony. And that, Mr. Klein, is the reality. The reality of imperialism, not the fault of communism. Lads, it's been a blast. Hopefully you've learned something this session. Hopefully you can subscribe to Danov, who has helped me loads to make this video. And hopefully, and I'm just hope, one day, Mr. Klein will delete his video out of shame. Let's get some pussy tonight.